Christmas is surprises. And I, it's really hard for me to, to surprise my wife with what I'm going to get her for Christmas because I don't really know what she likes. I mean, she'll say one thing and I interpret it a different way. And so very seldom am I actually able to surprise her with anything for Christmas. So I was feeling really good about it this year because I finally found part of her present that would surprise her. Now, not the whole present. I knew I wouldn't be able to surprise her with every aspect of her present, but I thought part of her present would, would really be able to surprise her when I discovered a make-your-own kombucha kit. Now, kombucha is a fermented, lightly effervescent, sweetened black or green tea drink commonly intended as a functional beverage for its supposed health benefits. See, Brooke is pseudo-granola. She's not all the way there, but she's pseudo-granola. Whereas I'm more, as many preservatives as you can pack into the food, that's my jam. Like, I know some people are like, oh, no preservatives. I'm like, put in more. Because the more preservatives in something, the better it tastes. Yes, I know it's not natural, but we're all going to die anyway and go be with Jesus. So pack those preservatives in, baby. So now Brooke doesn't feel the same way. She's a little more, a little more health conscious. She's a little more all natural. Not to the extreme or anything, but, but getting there. I worry about the future, so pray for us. Now, for those of you who are like me, who are pro-preservatives, you have no idea what I'm talking about with kombucha. And so it starts out as a sugary tea, which is a lie, but that's what they say, which is then fermented with the help of a SCOBY. Now, a SCOBY is actually an acronym for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. Merry Christmas, baby. It's very close cousins to the mother used to make vinegar. And this is what she likes to drink. So you leave the scoby, you leave that disgustingness in the tea for seven to ten days at room temperature. Now, I'm, I'm discovering all this after I've already ordered the Make Your Own Kombucha Kit. And I discovered that it was going to be shipped to us, and so it's out. And then I thought, I'm just going to throw the kit in the trunk of the car near the spare tire. Because let's be honest, most women have no idea where the spare tire is in the trunk. And then you'll be able to keep it there for safekeeping until Christmas and ensure the surprise. Now, for those of you ladies who do know where the spare tire is, props to you. You don't need to send the angry email. But if you do, it's Brian with an I at lakeside-church.com. All right, there you have it. I probably won't get back to you until the new year, but hey, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas, and props to you for knowing. You could probably change a tire easier than I, okay? So there's no shame in this. It's just generally a great hiding place, gentlemen, where they'll never discover the present. But then I discovered all of this talk about room temperature, and we live in Wisconsin, and the trunk of the car is not room temperature. And so I'm like, I better do some more research before I destroy the SCOBY and kill the whole kombucha present. And then I found this online. Kombucha is possibly safe for most adults when taken by mouth. Kombucha can cause side effects when contaminated, including stomach problems, yeast infections, allergic reactions, yellow skin, jaundice, nausea, vomiting, head and neck pain, and death. <laughs> It's at that moment I realized my incredible kiss Christmas surprise could kill my wife. <laughs> Merry Christmas, baby. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but that's one of the aspects that I love about Christmas is the surprise aspect of, of getting gifts, of, of not knowing what I'm going to be getting, of seeing the surprise on other people's face as they open up the gift that, that you got them and you put so much time and effort into and you see the joy that it instantly brings. And this morning we're going to look back at the very first Christmas and dreams of Christmas and we're going to see a surprise. But this was a surprise that was very different. It was a surprise that came to, to both Joseph and Mary. And we saw last week how the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and he let her know of God's plans for her and what God would do in her life. And now we get to see the other side of the relationship equation. We get to see Joseph as the news is broken to him 
So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. If you have your Bible apps, you can follow along on your phones and your tablets. And if not, the verses will be on the screens where we read these words. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Joseph and Mary are engaged Mary was a virgin, they hadn't had sexual relationships, and all of a sudden, Mary becomes pregnant when she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. You're engaged to the love of your life, and people are noticing there's a baby bump. It's not yours. Your fiancé is is pregnant. Imagine being Joseph. Imagine wing night with the guys as you sit down to watch some football. You got the order of wings, got a couple beers on the table, and you're all talking. They're having fun. Everybody's making fun of each other because that's what you do when you're guys and your friends. You know your friends because they're ripping on you and you're ripping on them. And if they're not ripping on you, they don't really like you. And if you're not really ripping on them, you don't really like them. It's an illness that all men have. I don't know why, but that's how we express our affection for one another. We make fun of each other. And so that's going on at the table. And Joseph's like, <clears throat> Mary's pregnant. Congrats, buddy. I mean, it goes outside the societal norm. It goes outside of what's really acceptable in our society, but it's a baby. It's a kid. It's something to be excited about. Congratulations, Joseph. It's not mine. Silence. Then it's everyone else at the table looking at each other kind of side-eyed. All of a sudden, the joking stops. Man, your heart just breaks for him. Here's the love of his life, and she's pregnant with somebody else's child. And before anybody can really say anything, before anybody can intervene, Joseph speaks up and says, It's God's. It's God's. And that's where everybody's just looking around the table. This guy's crazy. He's nuts. No, what? He's, he's crazy. He's a... I'm sure it took him back to the feeling he was initially feeling when he found out that Mary was pregnant and all of that. Just indecision, all of that. How in the world could it be? What do you say? What do we do? And I'm sure when the news met Joseph's friends, he flashed back to this. Because we're going to see God break the news to Joseph. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Joseph was an honorable guy. Mary's pregnant with a kid that's not his. He doesn't understand what all's going on. He's just discovered that Mary is pregnant, and, and he, wants to, he wants to end things. But he wants to do so in a way that, that's honorable, in a way that, that doesn't bring about any shame to her. He's unwilling to put her to shame because even, even in this time of uncertainty, he still loved her. He still wanted to do what was right. And so being an honorable guy that he was, he wanted to end things quietly. He didn't want there to be a, lot, a, a big show. He didn't want there to be the drama that so often can be prevalent at times of, of breakups. He just wants the relationship to end, and he wants to do it in a way that is kind and in a way that's honorable, to just kind of handle things quietly. He's not dropping bitter posts about her on social media. He's not tearing down her character to everybody else that he encounters. He just wants to end things quietly. He wants to do the right thing. 
And some of you right now at this time might be hurting and your hearts might be breaking because at this time where it seems like everybody is, is together and everybody's happy with somebody else, maybe you've just gone through a season where a relationship has ended really poorly. And maybe right now it's a really hard time for you in life because you see so much about Christmas and it brings back so many memories to when you were in a relationship, to when things were going well for you and you are dealing with the hurt right now of a relationship ending. And, and I just want to encourage you, whether that's something that's a fresh wound or whether it's an old wound or whether it's a wound that you're about to experience and you just don't see coming yet, I just want to encourage you that when you experience hardships in relationships, to be honorable. There are things that you will post that you can never take back. And sometimes when we are bitter and sometimes when our hearts are broken, we say things we don't really mean. But the problem is we can never get those things back. So I just want to challenge you, especially if you're young and you're dating and you're figuring all this out for the very first time. Be very careful what you post social media when you're hurt. Be very careful who you text when you're hurt. Be very careful what you say. And I know that the hurt's there, and I know that the heartache and the heartbreak is there, but be above it and do what's right and what's honorable, even when you've been wronged. And that can be really hard sometimes. But here is Joseph, who's engaged to somebody, and she's pregnant with a with the kid that isn't his, and he wants to end things with her, but he wants to do so in a way that doesn't bring her unnecessary shame. That's just being a good guy. And let's make sure that we're good men and we're good women, even when relationships that we feel so very strongly about end. Let's make sure that we're honorable and we do what's right. But as Joseph's considering these things, as he's going through these things in his mind of how he's going to end things with Mary, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Do not fear. Once again, we see this message from God to the people that he is working in and through. And the message is, do not fear. Fear. And I am convinced it is a message that we need to hear today, just as they needed to hear then. And certainly God is working in us in different ways than he was in Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph. And yet God is still at work. And we live in a culture and a society that wants nothing to do with God, that it is antagonistic towards so many of the things that we believe that is antagonistic to the very essence of love at the core rebels against the very message of Jesus and I am convinced the message of God to each and every one of us would be this do not fear when the hardship of this world comes when it seems like everything we put all of our hope and all of our trust and all of our faith in seems to break down a little bit when we experience things that we didn't sign up for and we never thought that we we would have to experience when we get the diagnosis and it looks grave when our final days are upon us when everything that we put all of our money into absolutely tanks and we find ourselves at a crossroads and we wonder how are we going to make ends meet when our kids rebel against us and the ones that we love so much and we would do anything for look us in the eyes and say I hate you and storm out the door and don't return a call or a text and refuse to repair the relationship, when we find ourselves broken, when we find ourselves empty, when we find ourselves with nothing to cling on to, I am convinced that this message is the message that God has for us today and every day. And that message is this, do not 
fear. There is a greater thing at work within us and around us than we can see and we can experience. And it is God. And his plan is bigger than our plan. And God works in, through, and in spite of broken people every single day. That's in spite of you, in spite of me, in spite of the people that have wronged us, and in spite of the people that we have wronged, and in spite of us because of the people that we've wronged. God is still at work. And so you might find yourself here today and you're broken and you're empty and you're discouraged. And if you hear Andy Williams sing one more time, happy holidays, you are going to just go off and just destroy a speaker. Your story isn't over. God is bigger. God is greater. And the angel says, this is God's doing. This is God's doing. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is the purpose of Christmas. We would look back and we would celebrate the immense love that God has for us. That he would humble himself in full divinity so much greater than us in our, in our humanity and the limitations that we have as people. And God would take himself and unite himself with our nature and be fully divine and fully, hum- and fully human at the same time. And the reason that he would come is to save us from our sins, to redeem us from our mistakes, to intervene where we have fallen short. This is the message of Jesus' coming. This is why he came. He came to save us. He came to set us free. He came so that every struggle that we face could be defeated. He came so that we can have hope in the most hopeless of times. He came so that this life is not that which defines us, but there is something so much more. He came to restore a relationship that we had broken. He came to redeem Redeem us when we had rebelled. He came so that we could once again have communion with God. This is the purpose of God's coming. And when we understand that we are not enough, when we understand that we have fallen short, when we understand that there's a standard that God has, and that standard is perfection, and none of us can measure up to that standard, and God loves us anyways in spite of that fact, and still desires a relationship with us so that in Jesus we can measure up to that standard of perfection. When we really grasp onto that and when we keep that the central focus of our lives, we understand there's nothing to fear. And it doesn't mean that we walk through life with a false optimism. It doesn't mean that we walk through life with just this this hope that doesn't make any sense. But rather, what it means is we understand the ultimate purpose for us being created. And all of this is possible. The fact that we can walk through life without fear is possible. Because Jesus was born to a virgin. A couple thousand years ago. And the reason that he came was to save us and to set us free. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Why do we not have to fear? Why can we walk through life with hope? Why can we walk through life with peace? Why do our circumstances not define us? Because we aren't alone. 
because we aren't alone, because God is with us. They called his name Emmanuel, which literally means God with us. So no matter what we face, no matter what we encounter, no matter what we go through, we are not alone. We don't have to rely upon ourselves. God is at work. He's not a distant deity who wants nothing to do with us. God is at work and at play in us our lives. In the everyday aspect of our lives, God is at work. We can have a personal relationship with our creator. We can have a personal relationship with the one who spoke and created this world into existence. We can have a relationship with the one that we rebelled against. We can have a relationship with God who is more powerful than we can ever wrap our minds around. And all of that is available to us if we will just accept it. God is with us. He is at work. This is why he came. This is why he came. So that none of us have to walk through life alone. God with us. This is the very definition of hope. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife. They were married, but knew her not until she had given birth to his son. And he called his name Jesus. They got married, they stayed celibate until after the birth of Jesus, and they gave birth to Jesus. They raised their child, who would go on to alter the course of not just human history, but alter every aspect of the direction of humanity. See, the purpose of Jesus' coming was not to have a birth that we look back and we celebrate. The purpose of Jesus' coming was for him to fulfill a mission. And as we celebrate the birth of a baby in a manger, we have to understand that the whole purpose of that birth was foretold to Joseph. But it was the death upon a cross to pay my mistakes and your mistakes. Because God has a standard, because God's holy and God's perfect. And in his perfection, his standard is perfection. This is why it doesn't matter how good you are. You will never do enough good. It just simply doesn't matter. There isn't a sliding scale. God doesn't, certainly doesn't grade on a curve. There is a standard, and that standard is perfection. And you either pass or you fail. And none of us pass. And on one hand, this can seem so unfair. Because all of us can list tens, if not hundreds of people that we're better than. And that's not an egotistical statement. We just look at them and we're like, you're not a nice person. You don't have much to offer the human race. Like, you're literally, you're not good. I'm I'm better than you. And, and we can start very easily, right? We're like, Hitler. And it's like, oh, yeah. But that's easy. But then we start, start to list some other names. And, and we're like, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Like, I'm not perfect, but I'm not them. And if we're honest with ourselves, the flip side's also true. And so if there wasn't this standard that God had established, we would constantly be living in this state of flux, 
constantly uncertain of whether or not we have done enough, whether or not we were good enough, whether or not we could measure up to God. And there's no peace there. So instead, God says, do not fear. You're not good enough. You can't measure up. You've made mistakes. You don't meet my standard. But I love you so much, I'll meet it for you. So Jesus is born, and he grows. He does some incredible, miraculous things. He changes people's lives. He challenges the most religious people that he would encounter. He welcomes the people that the religious people would think God would want nothing to do with. And then he goes and he dies. Because God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, who was perfect, to be sin for me and for you so that in him you might become the righteousness, the perfection of God's standard. For the wages of sin, the cost of sin, the Bible tells us, is death. That's the cost of our mistakes. That's the cost of our rebellion. And it's the cost that we will all pay. But there's more than one aspect to this death. It's a physical death, which we will all experience. And our bodies are in a constant, just a constant decay. But it's also a spiritual death. Which is an eternity apart from God, our Creator. That's the cost of our rebellion. That's the cost of our sin. That's the cost of our mistakes. But the gift of God, but the hope that we have, the reason we have not to fear, but the gift of God is eternal life, is life everlasting that we will experience with our Creator through what Jesus has done on our behalf, that he died on a cross for my mistakes, for my shortcomings, for my sins, and for your mistakes, for your shortcomings, and your sins. And three days later, he rose again, proving that he was victorious over death, proving he was victorious over our mistakes, proving he was victorious over hell, proving he was victorious over everything proving the reason that he came was fulfilled and his mission was fulfilled, that we could live with God with us and at work in us and we could experience peace. And so the only question I have for you today is have you experienced? Have you allowed the gift to become your own so that you can walk through life with no fear, knowing that God is with you and he is on your side? God, I pray that we would be people never lose sight of your love for us. That we would never lose sight of what your love for us cost. That we would walk through life without fear. That we would embrace the fact that you are with us. God, I pray that, I just pray for the person here who right now is going through heartache. And life is hard and difficult and messy. and It seems like there is no hope. God, that you would work. I 
pray, God, for the person that's here that's never made the decision to follow you and who's tried their best on their own and who's done some really great things and who's a really good person. But, God, I just pray that the, the sobering reality of the fact that your standard is perfection would permeate their hearts. And, God, today, that as they're faced with the consequences of their actions, they would just say, God, I understand that I messed up. I made some mistakes. And I need you. I realize in your incredible love for us that you came here. Your son Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and for my sin. He rose again, and God, I want to live for you. So I give you my life. God, I pray that we would live with nothing to fear, knowing that you are with us. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.